Um, I guess that most of you are here because you, um, the issues that are going to be raised here puzzle you and you're interested in the complexities of them at this particular point in time. Uh, this is particularly so given the announcement last week of a more integrationist multicultural policy, uh, sorry, not policy, statement, um, <laughs> and the current debate regarding constitutional change um, and Indigenous people in Australia. And I won't mention Bill C-18 because it's not going to get through. Um, I begin with my place um, in the western suburbs of um, Sydney. Uh, as a post-war child, uh, I was part of, of the working class families moving into this western Sydney space. There were many of us. Lots were children of migrants, including myself and most of my friends, looking for an opportunity away from the detritus of war and the ravaged cities back in Europe and the UK. In Villawood Housing Estate, where I lived in Gurnaroy Street, there were immigrants, where that big red mark is, was where it was and is. Um, Immigrants, Aboriginal families, single mums and people with mental illness. There were factories all around us and there still are, you can see from the Google map. My closest friends at the local public school, at Billwood East Public School in Luana Avenue, were Aboriginal, Fijian, Irish Catholic and those with single mums. Housos, as we were called, were people whom Prime Minister Robert Menzies decided needed some time to pick themselves up after the war. And so there were vast estates built in the western suburbs with new public schools for the growing population. Many people had fallen on hard times through no fault of their own, and my parents were part of that story. In time, they saved up for a block of land, a pre-designed weatherboard home, and a move to northwestern Sydney, where there were more trees, orchards and a new start. We left the wood when I finished fifth class, as it was known then, 95. There were also immigrants in Carlingford North where we moved, mainly bush, and we were the second house built in the street. I had to ride my bicycle to school as there was no bus, to Epping West Primary School, which was an uncomfortable mix of lower and upper middle class people. There were Italian market gardeners, such as the parents of my friend Josephine, whom I taught English to in year six because nobody else bothered. Another friend, Christine, had parents who owned a citra orchard with a great creek for swimming down the back that gave me expertise with swimming. We gave him. In high school, Latvians introduced me to basketball, a lifelong obsession, and snow skiing. I played next ball with Pex Pixie Sin, one of the few Chinese, Russian emigres dominated the top echelon of the school academic list, and a Dutch Indonesian friend of her family ignited my interest in learning Indonesian at school and a love of Indonesian food. The point is, there was no space that I moved where immigrants were not in my life. A different image that is often perpetuated about Australia back in those times. Such has been the life of Australia for many of us particularly those who were working class and attended public schools in Sydney's western suburbs. The only advocates in the new area I moved into was an Aboriginal presence that had been erased through private ownership of land and the names of streets were heroes or events from the war, Bengazi, Triple and Alamein. This story of demographic diversity is not only mine, of course, but it was the one not evident in any text or the imaginaries of the nation. These were seen as differences to be respected, but not brought into a public space that was essentially monocultural. But they did exist and provided a different perspective on the world, even if it wasn't articulated or valued. This demographic diversity or reality would come to shape a different future, one that would see the failure and the end of assimilation policy. And the reasons were clear. How could assimilation occur if there was no structural support for English language? Should cultural and linguistic diversity be raised? And socioeconomic assimilation did not occur anyway. At the completion of high school, like a number of people here, there were massive movements and resistances, anti-Vietnam rallies, uh, indigenous call for land rights, freedom rights, and so on. 
The outcomes of this period was the election of the Whitlam government, a Labor government leading to free tertiary education, <coughs> which, um, which um, enabled me, um, from my background, to go into teacher education. Oh, Thank you, Mark. That's fine. <laughs> 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 really good talk now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, my teacher education was absolutely outstanding. It was a time of questioning traditional explanations related to merit, to difference, and radical educators were across all curriculum areas. This was the Sydney College of Advanced Education attached to Sydney University. Um, we were asked to imagine how it might be different. We have history and philosophy. Um, this wasn't a time of punishment, narrowness of ideas, and lists of competencies, but one of opportunity, creativity, and innovation. I hope it doesn't collapse. Uh, there was what Raymond Williams has called a structure of feeling that permeated social life, a sense of optimism <laughs> and critical engagement focused on equity. When I finished teacher education, there were no jobs. Um, like now, I waited three years. I received a phone call from the department, um, but he said, unfortunately, you probably won't like the school. It was Redfern. Oh. I had no preconceived notions about the area or the school. I was simply excited to be finally working full time. The most striking thing about the school was the poverty. At that stage, ethnic and racialised differences were less visible to me compared to the lack of resources in the neighbourhood and in the lives of the students. In my second year at the school, we developed the first ever average school-based Aboriginal education policy in New South Wales. Two teachers and executive Aboriginal education assistant, Mari Cohen, and two Aboriginal community members, Danny Slater, who has since passed away, and Anne Wilden, who's still an activist. The key theme was point five, Aboriginality without a tag. Now this idea of Aboriginality was discussed at length so that every activity, community participation and process of staff development was focused on a non-static and diverse construction of what it meant to be Aboriginal a focus on political history, um, more traditions and mission days, as well as local community organisations and activities centred on the block, alive. There was a diversity of representations. Anti-racism was central. Engaging with community organisations, we set up a radio station. Many, many high profile people from the media and from the entertainment area and researchers would come to the school. They were heady days, mm. but it wasn't all that simple. There were moments that stick out in my memory, those kind of moments where you think, is all well. The first was the raid. This was a raid following a number of events through the 1980s in the block, which was that area there, um, four streets around it was considered a no-go area, not for me because I was a teacher, I was known and held a privileged place in that community. But these policing operations, this particularly in February 1990, was a raid where police, 70 police led by the tactical response group, uh, raided at least eight houses with sledgehammers, iron bars and guns. After the raid, one of the kids from the block who was in my class at the time recounted the previous night's activities, stating over and over again that he was a good boy, not one of the lads, and he was at home hiding under the bed when the others were out throwing rocks at the cops. The second moment was a showing of David Brandenburg's state of shock. Next to me were two community members. One, a mother of a girl in my class said, I'm sick of always seeing negative images of our mob. Nobody ever shows that we're trying hard and doing good things. Increasingly, I felt uncomfortable that a combative political environment was taking a toll on the kids and the political strategy of pointing out racism and disadvantage was taking a toll on parents. The contradictions were difficult to untangle. 
During my honours year in sociology at Macquarie, I came across the work of Kevin Keefe, which helped me untangle some of the contradictions. He argued that culture seemed to be understood in Aboriginal education and Aboriginal policy in general as either Aboriginality as persistence, and that is the ongoing maintenance of culture, or a more overtly political construction of Aboriginality as resistance. The first could lead people to being constructed as unable to adapt and change, while the latter led to images of chaos and incapacity to manage lives. The latter, however, resulted in the Mabo decision, a national survey of Aboriginal education and a range of other rights. At this time, the importance of organisations working together to achieve outcomes, such as the New South Wales Teachers Federation working with Aboriginal groups, was critical. So resistance was critical at the time to carve out a space for change and multi-institutional support was critical. In 1987, I was part of writing the school-based multicultural policy and here we were thinking about community language teachers we might employ, what culture classes might mean um, and, and the celebration of our ethnically diverse school. The focus, and you can't see this because it's a photocopy, um, was very much on issues of prejudice, understanding racism, discrimination and ethnocentrism. But in the main, we had wonderful events, multicultural days, um, which we just, year after year, grew bigger and bigger. We also wrote musicals and enjoyed a musician exploring different, employed a musician exploring different stories and developed anti-racism strategies. Now these two policy uh, domains, multicultural and indigenous education, were quite separate, but they had parallel concerns and some familiar aspects. Among these was a focus on maintenance of culture, of language, respect for diversity and celebration and commitment. Yet multiculturality in the face of nationalism produced further contradictions. Mm. Anzac Day was celebrated each year and each year we would say in our staff room that we should suspend these. This particular event caused a lot of debate and disagreement amongst staff. In my class one year, a year five girl who identified as Turkish, after viewing a film in assembly about the Anzacs of Gallipoli, came to me in tears saying, are Turkish people badness? <laughs> the following year, there was enough of us objecting to the day to suspend it. But this didn't last long. In 1988, a significant bicentennial year of protest by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, John Howard announced the One Australia policy, a forerunner to Pauline Hanson's One Nation. What concerned John Howard was the impossibility of an Australian ethos, a common Australian culture. Fear of Asian immigration was central. This followed a lot of debate publicly, notably by Geoffrey Blaney, that said multiculturalism mm. was a cluster of tribes. Mm. While the political interpretation of multiculturalism was debated, schools continued a pluralistic form of multiculturalism. Uh, it all but lost the critical edge, but this was in a climate when nationalism was on the rise again. However, this form of multicultural education was open to co-option to a nationalist agenda. So the problem of culture that keeps running through these years and these policy periods about who has it and what it is was increasingly discussed on the left and right of politics. Raymond Williams, of course, has said that culture is one of the most difficult words in the English language to define. Mm -hmm. And in education, mm -hmm. these difficulties were clearly manifest in the way in which the policy was enacted, if not necessarily intended. Mm -hmm. Throughout the 90s, changes to funding and research in the area started to impact on innovation of multicultural education. So we weren't to say the N word and that had a whole flow on effect. So research and innovation and so on came to pretty much a standstill. Australia was once the global leader in multicultural education, particularly in the 1980s. There was still support for English language teachers, although competing paradigms regarding mainstreaming versus separate classes increased. Uh, to some extent in New South Wales, there's been a downward provision of these services, uh, which was which may well present some issues with the latest arrival of refugees, but we'll see how that plays out. We entered a period of no real policy and multiculturalism at national level, 
and in Aboriginal affairs, affairs more generally, there was an increase in intervention. An integrationist agenda was increasingly sought, often code for assimilation. And we see this in the cohesion and harmony uh, that's tended to dominate um, uh, where the funding will go and where the activities are situated. Mm. And of course, by talking about cohesion and harmony, the assumption is that immigrants um, are a problem for cohesion and harmony. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so an integrationist, integrationist agenda was increasingly sought um, and um, therefore what really happened in schools was we depended on the goodwill of teachers to carry on the legacy of multicultural policies and programs. Um, okay, but there is a problem and research, and I, I go right back here through to for a long period, research has repeatedly shown um, that teachers have a problem with a more critical kind of multiculturalism that focuses around equity. Um, they have a problem with anti-racism. Um, there are problems where it's sometimes um, too easily understood or simply racism doesn't exist here. Um, but if you, if you look at the lack of um, uh, research and policy based on evidence-based research, uh, it's no wonder that this is where it's got to. So, currently in Australia, we're now moved into a whole new era where globalisation and its effects have produced a retreat from openness and renewed nationalism. In the context of super diversity, that means people from multiple places of origin, uh, like we don't have the mass immigration from Greece and Italy like we had, for example, the Syrian conflict refugees aren't just Syrians. Um, so we have a, uh, a much greater sign of super diversity and people are coming and going and not necessarily settling. Um, and with this we have these uh, scapes. We have money moving and ideas moving and technology moving and people moving. So in the context of this, um, there's been a retreat uh, leading to populism in some places, Brexit and attempts to hot change through more and more walls. Um, and the reason for this is that globalisation is a contradictory um, and it's an uneven process. Um, first world is doing very well out of it, the third world is being de de developed dramatically, um, but at the expense of some of their human rights. Um, local communities feel that they're um, on the one hand being um, homogenised by um, uh, other cultures um, coming in, like often there was a stage where we talked about American culture dominating, um, but there's a fear that life as it is known um, is going to disappear. So people talk about the dilution and the corruption of their cultural beliefs. But the problem, uh, even though people think it's migrants, is actually neoliberalism. Mm. Um, now, from the mid-1990s, this is the overwhelming influence on social life mm -hmm. and education. Uh, its tentacles have seeped into every corner of our lives. Connell has argued that neoliberalism is a set of economic policies and practices centred on the free market, and it is ontoformative, uh, meaning that it creates new social identities. So globalisation is scaffolded by these neoliberal policies and practices, which give the attended movements of people, ideas, media and finances particular characteristics. For example, parents interact differently and families are less concerned with emotional relations and more with scouting opportunities for their children, mm -hmm. negotiating pathways and adjusting to an increasingly complex education market. This market is connected to globalisation in very important ways. Now the impact is profound. The education for me is so unrecognisable into my time as a teacher, completely mm. unrecognisable. As a teacher educator over the last 25 years, I've seen the theoretical terrain shift from Marxist understandings of inequality to post-structuralist approaches. I've looked away to the bigger picture as increasingly the smaller picture has been shaped by these larger movements. Globally, the interest in cosmopolitan theory as a, as a counter to closed borders and minds has grown. So I want to spend um, the rest of the talk engaging with the importance of, of 
cosmopolitan thinking um, as, a, as, as not a way to um, denounce and, and say that multiculturalism and indigenous education policy don't matter, but to add something to the mix, to, to try and, thank you, um, uh, situate it um, in the contemporary um, context. Um, I want to take some key examples from public intellectuals and my own research. I'll explore the idea of indigenous and refugee cosmopolitans and then unpick what these might mean for a new way of thinking in education. Uh, now, um, before uh, arguing for a particular understanding of cosmopolitan theory, which I will, um, it's important to acknowledge that there's all these different ways of, of uh, talking about it. This list is not exhaustive, uh, and many of you will use the term. I'm increasingly hearing people use the term cosmopolitan, and I'm never sure how they're using it. Um, and it could be any of these. Um, I tend to think most people can't use number um, two, a kind of philosophical worldview where people might have multiple allegiances, or number five, a disposition, a mode of orientation to the world. But I think more common, um, is this kind of view. Um, and this is the old view of cosmopolitan, um, cosmopolitan um, thinking, is that um, new cosmopolitan theory critiques this old view. So the cosmopolitan was this person that was part of the elite, the old colonial, who the expat, which I'm, I'm I read the other day, is only ever used for whites, it's never used for others, mm. they're migrants. <laughs> um, that um, food, travel, exotic, rootless and so on, very much the privileged view of what cosmopolitan is. And I, and I hear that used all the time by industry and a range of people. But that and a demographic centre are probably the main ways that it's used. Okay, now, in a quarterly essay, I begin with Indigenous cosmopolitans. In a quarterly essay, Stan Grant, Indigenous Affairs, Indigenous Affairs Editor at the ABC, questioned the narrative that is often used to explain Indigenous inequality in Australia. He has, he notes, used it himself, but when he did, he was surprised at the widespread reaction it caused and the assumptions that were made. He wanted, he said, to challenge the politics of identity that can trap us in perpetual victimhood. My own PhD revealed identity traps for Indigenous teacher education students in Australia and Canada, which emerged in racialized ways in the programs they were taking part in. This was in the period 1996 to 2000, so the tensions around the politics of identity aren't new. Mm. As I noted in my school teaching years, it is this very process of racialization in constitutional reform that has been debated. Grant comments on a book he read, in praise of forgetting historical memory and its ironies. The book caused him to re-examine his own history through another lens, an economic migration story. From the fringes of the frontier, indigenous people started to connect with the colonial economy, like migrants everywhere. They were marooned by the tides of history, the products of our people and violence, forced from their homes like refugees. Here is a connection to others that's not been made very much. He takes his family as a prime example, moving across three generations from itinerant fruit picking, sawmilling, tent boxing, to itinerant or at least globetrotting TV journalism. This is not to deny the bigotry and racism that was wrought on Aboriginal communities and still is in some cases, but instead it has a focus on transformation and a shared history. These are the themes through cosmopolitan theory, transformation and shared history. Using cosmopolitan theory, Forte, in the second uh, book here on indigenous cosmopolitans, traces the ways in which indigeneity, for example, can be associated with mobility and transformation, rather than the idea that indigeneity is place-centred, fixed and unchanging. He critiques the idea that indigenous people, on the one hand, can be rooted in place, where they're, they're cut off, but simultaneously suffering from modernity and stuck under themselves. In Australia, this is patently incorrect. For example, Indigenous people in the top end, we know the story, traded and partnered with Macassans. Now, Papasa Giardis um, has written a lovely piece here uh, in this book, Ocean to Outback, 
Um, and he examined the Papania tool artists of the Western Desert uh, and the ways in which their art was reimagined to both represent their world, which was violently disrupted from without by the colonial government, rounding them up onto missions, and from within by multiple language groups being forced together. Now he said that this caused an act of cultural translation. Mm. A new symbolic process emerged which, according to the passage artists, was a form of Indigenous cosmopolitanism. Now today, Indigenous Australians have the highest rate of outpartnering of any group in Australia. In 2011, 56.5% of partners Indigenous male had a non-Indigenous partner, slightly lower than the corresponding figure of 59% for Indigenous females. In Sydney and Melbourne, around 82 to 83% of partnered males and females had a non-Indigenous partner. Now, in summary, it could be argued, as does Forte, that the Australian Indigenous people are the first cosmopolitans <coughs> who traded, intermarried, and were wholly, highly mobile, continually transforming culture. Now, some changes occurring. It's not just Stan Grant, but I heard a young woman on Radio National a few weeks ago who has set up a new project. This might interest you, Anne Power. Right? Yeah. Um, on mission songs. And she said, I don't want to know about traditional things anymore. There's four to five generations of uncold, unrecorded cultural practice of, of new writing of music that was done on missions that nobody has ever recorded or listed. So there's an interest now in transformation. Things are changing. I'm, I'm not on my path alone uh, looking for this transformation. So this was a time of creativity and resilience. Um, indeed, when I talked, when I presented something on this in Charles Sturt University, one of the ex um, Aboriginal teacher education students came up to me and said, oh yeah, when we lived on the mission, we used to play cards with the Chinese market garden next door, and we not only exchanged ideas and games and food, but we exchanged people. So there's Afghans in my family and Chinese in my family, mm -hmm. and if you look, many of the names of Aboriginal people in Western New South Wales bear the marks of these exchanges. Mm -hmm. While some of these names were assigned by employers, it nevertheless speaks of an absence of stories untold in our collective history. Central to the idea of cosmopolitan thinking then is cultural translation. Um, there wouldn't be a person in this room who has not found themselves um, or experienced the void, a sense of not knowing, of being lost, of being in a situation where you can't draw on um, the knowledge that you have. Um, refugees experience this, as have Indigenous people. We all have. Capacity Artist says that instead of the clash of civilization species, which is dominant, that people who are different meet and they automatically don't get on, mm -hmm. that we've, we're better off to understand um, this space as a void, as a place in which people connect and try to comprehend and evaluate. And in the process, they actually create new knowledge. So it's an expressive and it's a productive space. It's not one of loss, and the dominant narrative we've had is one of loss. So this paradigm of clash of civilizations actually underscores the fear-mongering that's uh, circulating globally, and also the everyday construction of students who are seemingly unknowable. I've recently published a chapter with Donna Marie Stevens, um, an Aboriginal woman from Darwin, in which we try to explore how this framework might um, shape a different narrative. Uh, Donna had never discussed her uh, family history in this way and was surprised at the influences and mobilities within her family um, from uh, resulting from translocal connections. Um, she talks of her great-great-grandfather, a Scotsman, who came to the territory searching for grazing lands. Um, he met and married via traditional formalised men's business, a Bathurst Island woman. Her great-grandfather then grew up in the top end and he eventually um, married a woman from the Torres Strait. And so her family were therefore had an ongoing process of cultural translation between Scottish, Thursday Island, Bathurst Island and Melville Island narrators, as well as the Mirren and West Arnhem land. And then her own grandmother, who was the fifth child born to the great-grandparents, moved to Darwin um, with her mother. And in Darwin, where they lived in the melting pot of cultures, she met a Patagonian man. Mm -hmm. 
they married and have seven children of their own. So this family history, this just this small story, um, of which we don't have many, reveals the translocal pathways of not only different clans, but also immigrants. In a similar pain, I wrote a paper with Ahmed Al-Khalil, a former refugee who completed his PhD on second language um, acquisition. We were interested in ideas about the way in which refugees might be constructed less of victims lacking agency, because if they lack agency, then they're a strain on the government's purse, um, which is a dominant narrative. And more as people who are developing techniques for living and forming solidarities. Um, their rootedness comes from their estrangement and their displacement, um, if not necessarily one single place. So contemporary writing and reportage is re replete with stories of trauma. Um, and in Nam Lee's book, The Boat, he recalls his father's rhetorical question. Sometimes it's better to forget, no. And this is similar to what Stan Grant is saying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is better to forget. Um, and I've got to be here, but I'm watching conscious of the time. Um, okay, so um, we know, for example, with refugees, that in fact, these are not alternative things, um, that, that many of them um, um, uh, have a um, tremendous um, commitment to education and many are entrepreneurial. Um, mm. So there's a lot of work that shows that they're widely found in small and medium businesses. So the idea of, of being a drain on the purse and um, not being able to move forward um, is patently incorrect in terms of the evidence that's available. So, Australia's had a great history of successful settlement, um, despite the occasional problems, but people may no longer be settling, they may be circular migrants, mm. may have two passports, may feel committed to other places. These, these earlier policy periods were premised on a particular view of social life. They were about the maintenance of ways of life, the nation as well as different cultural and linguistic markers. Given the different times, do we need a new language? I would argue that cosmopolitanism or cosmopolitan person, sorry, has already entered daily discourse, but with little understanding of the complexity. Now, recent theories um, around cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitan theory, um, are quite broad, but the one that's most useful um, when you're thinking about practitioners is the idea of the bottom-up um, uh, working class cosmopolitan. Um, the focus is on actually pra existing practical stances um, rather than any kind of prescriptive um, ways in which people should respond. It allows a reading of practices that are not immobile, um, and we've just talked about refugees, and the people have their own world views. But also, um, it's multi-scalar cosmopolitanism. Um, Gidwani and Sivara Makwishman um, talk about cosmopolitanism in relation to the movement of people within India itself, within regions. And we have a parallel situation in Australia where um, uh, uh, workers from, we've just had one actually this morning about workers uh, from Vanuatu being ripped off in the North Queensland. Um, but people being brought in to be seasonal workers, and these are changing the face of um, regional and rural Australia. But regional and rural Australia has, people, has had people moving in and out um, for a long, long period of time. It's not new. And the, and the, the um, construction of the rural has been somehow separate and pristine and not, never changing is just uh, patently incorrect. So they looked at the changing regional labour markets and they found that there were new relations to production and reproduction. So here, the patrician tra transnational cosmopolitan, okay, uh, runs businesses um, and the plebeian cosmopolitans, um, the young girls from the villages, work as domestics. But these set up unequal relationships. Um, so cosmopolitanism is not all about everything being equal and we just are open to change and diversity. It's out actually keeping an eye on the change in nature of these inequalities. Um, this changing um, economic differentiation and legal stratification um, 
is revealed in New South Wales in a study that I did recently on compulsory schooling, where um, the new compulsory schooling age and the certification that young people had to have to do um, apprenticeships meant that they could no longer use their connections in their community to do apprenticeships. So people who had village um, plumbing uh, qualifications but not a certificate from somewhere in, in New South Wales could no longer take on an apprentice. All right, so this... Um, We'll move on to um, cosmopolitan thinking because I think we're going to run out of time. Um, so I'm arguing that what we need is a kind of cosmopolitan thinking. It's, it's not only this idea of being aware of global movements, but it's also a distancing from our own national, our own culture and our own nationalism, a kind of ironic distance as Brian Turner has called it. Um, Sharon Todd argues that we need to think without scripts so one of the difficulties we had with multicultural indigenous education early on was we had a lot of scripts about how to, you know, I, I remember when I was teaching, you know, um, if you had Lebanese kids in the class, then, then you would have flat bread and, you know, <laughs> the best kids have rice, you know. Like, so this was a change from, you know, the white bread society and we had to go through that, but it was fairly stereotypical. So, Things are very unpredictable now, so thinking without scripts. Um, and it's no use in the void when you don't know what's going to happen. You need to do some kind of cultural translation yourself. So the key focus then is on seeking some justice um, through thoughtfulness and not according to some abstract cosmopolitanism. And Todd draws on Hannah Arendt's early work, a wonderful um, thinker, um, that you have to think without banisters. So, what does this mean? Um, if I look at, um, if I focus on transformation rather than fixed identities, which was the problem with the previous policy periods in Indigenous and multicultural education, um, I'm looking at the actual existing practices. Now, um, Michael and Jock and I did a study on the global movements of teachers, and, and one of the things we found was that there, the focus on assimilating teachers into our way of doing things meant that we ignored the knowledge that they had, mm. okay? So their actually existing practices mm. were just completely erased rather than a connection being made between their practices um, and the ones that we were trying to um, have them understand. Um, so you got, you got comments like, well, you know, um, they're just interested in teacher-centred learning, they're not interested in child-centred learning and so on. So there was no engagement with that. So a cosmopolitan thinking would actually engage with those different ways. Um, in um, the compulsory schooling um, uh, study I did, young Muslim males were pathologised for visiting their parents' home country. Yet this is at a time when overseas experience so is valued for others. All of these trips we're doing with our teacher education students, um, people go on study abroad. Um, in high schools they go on you know, they go to third world countries and do things for a while, and that's all valued. But these Lebanese boys in particular, who at around the age of 15 and 16 seem to be commonly sent back for six months um, to re-engage with family, and also to make connections for which they might want to be working later, that's pathologised as an interruption to their schooling. Um, and also here, young Arabic-speaking background students who were working in um, small and medium enterprises, families, relatives and so on in southwestern Sydney. The teachers were complaining that come to school dead tired the next day and couldn't <coughs> engage with the curriculum. But nobody thought they were already doing something. Mm -hmm. That in fact they were using their networks um, and that kind of cosmopolitan thinking that says, all right, well what are they doing? What can we offer that will connect to that, such as small business studies in the school, and what's not even offered a TAFE, by the way, um, is another way um, to connect. So that's just um, very brief. Um, I think in terms of future research, um, one, we really start needing evidence-based policy. Um, we need research, again, we need an investment in research that begins with practitioners, but always with partners. One of the things that I've really found is working with partners um, gives uh, more of a cosmopolitan view 
I think that in education we're often stymied into a narrow view of what the world is, but working with partners who actually are focused on the agentic movements um, of people really opens your eyes to that. Now we currently have a, an application in, and who knows if we'll get it, looking at Syrian conflict refugees with our national partners. Um, you know, Violet's up the back there, Settlement Services have just won an award for the uh, national award for the work that they've done um, getting people started in small businesses, refugees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these other organisations, and of course partners overseas who are also working with the massive movement of people at the moment, but we may not get it. Um, a focus on transformation of knowledge, such as the work Michael Singh has, and Jing He have been doing. Um, and Cathy Marsh now, Cathy Marsh did a brilliant um, PhD years ago, um, where she looked at the way in which um, rhymes, children's rhymes, changed in the playground as a consequence of immigration. Hmm. It was a groundbreaking, breaking piece of research, and I've not seen anything done like that since. Um, uh, documenting stories such as those by Donna in Darwin for use or production in classrooms. I mean, why do we ask children when to, to write stories? It's often about a particular ethnicity when. I know my students in my cosmopolitan unit talk about the fact that they always had to write about one aspect of their identity rather than the fact that they had grandparents and multiple kinds of identities. Um, and the same goes for Indigenous students. But also in flight practices in classrooms, how do teachers actually think and respond? And it requires a particular methodology, not walking in and interviewing, but actually a really long ethnographic a dense, thick um, observation process. So, there is a link here. There is an epistemological link here between the sociology of knowledge and Indigenous multicultural anti-racism education. The rise of sociology as a discipline, that's my disciplinary background as well as education, corresponded with the rise of the bounded nation state and we rejected the notion of a free cosmopolitanism which I'm not advocating. Liberal multiculturalism and indigenous education policy focused on group rights within a nation state, which focuses on assumed separateness and boundedness. We, you see this all the time in research inside schools. So cosmopolitan theory provides a way of uh, focusing on the agentic moves of subjects. It's multi-scalar, so you can look at different spatialities and temporalities. Um, it brings the metropolis and the rural into dialogue and it challenges neoliberalism because the collective strategies and new knowledge may not be able to be maintained. Now this professional uh, personal journey I've outlined reveals transformations right across the history that were necessary in Australian society and schooling and the contradictions that emerged. In the few examples in, uh, given in this paper, cosmopolitan theory provides a way of focusing on the agentic moves of subjects. In the critical approaches, this means that you don't lose sight of power, but also not assuming that race or colonial thinking is a source of power. Mm. In the words of Karatani and Debashi, neoliberalism is the new imperialism. Mm. A multi-scalar cosmopolitanism is attuned to these, and these can be harnessed for more equitable outcomes. And the last quote is Stan, although I think this is Stan's life than a lot of other people, but nevertheless it points to a different kind um, and a different construction. Thank you. I think there's two hallmarks of a professorial address. One is that they make you think, mm -hmm. and the other one is they make you look at things again offer a different perspective mm. and I think Carol's work here yeah. has fulfilled those two hallmarks in, in tremendous ways so thank you very much for that. It's very <laughs>